sends his profuse apologies. He's unable to be with you because of ill health, um, but we expect him to be back in the university in the next few days. And in fact, Nancy Roswell, the Deputy President and Deputy Vice Chancellor. So, welcome to the flagship event in the Alumni Association's annual calendar. And indeed, speaking on behalf of the university, one of our most important events of the year as well. As alumni, and I can say that almost all of you are alumni because you took all the tickets, so very few of our own staff were able to be here. It was wonderful to see so many of you. But as alumni, you're key stakeholders at the university. Past, obviously, present, and very much in the future. Your interest in and support for the university is vital to us and enormously appreciated, not just tonight, but on every day on campus. So thank you all for being here. The university's overall goals can be summed up as the pursuit of virtuosity for the overall benefit of the planet. So it's especially appropriate that this lecture is named after two virtuoso academics and thinkers, known as Robert Foto and John Popcorn, whose work has been so important in shaping our modern world. We're delighted that Sir John Cockroft's family are again represented here tonight through Joe Blackman, Sir John's daughter, here with her daughter Claire, Peter Cockroft, Sir John's nephew, and among his textile alumnus himself, with his wife Susan, daughter Heather, and grandson Jeff. You all know that. Virtuoso is also an entirely appropriate term to use in conjunction with our speaker this evening, Lord Rees of Ludlow. Martin Rees is Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics and Master of Trinity College at the University of Cambridge and is a Stronghold Royal and President of the Royal Society, so clearly a multitasker as well. After study at the University of Cambridge, he held postdoctoral positions in the UK and USA before returning to the UK as a Professor at Sussex and then moving on to Cambridge where he became a fellow at Paul's College. As author or co-author of more than 500 research papers, mainly on astrophysics and cosmology, as well as seven books, five for general readership, and I know the President Alan Gilbert is a particular fan of Martin's books. He's written numerous magazine and newspaper articles on scientific and general subjects. He's broadcast and lectured widely. If I were to tell you about the number of positions he holds, the awards and accolades that he received, I would take up the whole time of the lecture. I should, however, just briefly mention that in 2005 he was appointed to the House of Lords and elected President of the And was especially glad that he's here to speak to us in 2010 because this is the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society, which he's led so admirably for the last five years. And the celebrations going on throughout the year, and particularly during the summer. The Royal Society, as we know, plays a pivotal role in public engagement of science and discussing important scientific issues. So it's appropriate that we have Martin here to talk to us today because this is something that we place very highly as part of the university. And rarely, if ever, has this role been more important than the challenges we face across the world. We're honoured that the university has many strong links with the Royal Society and represented here as one of the previous vice presidents and the vice president at the present time. Paul Rees' talk tonight on our cosmic environment is also appropriate, given the university's long-standing and ongoing interest in astronomy and cosmology, represented not least by what is often known as an iconic uh, landmark juggle bank. For all of these reasons, it's a particular pleasure and honour to invite you, Paul Rees, to deliver tonight's pop rock of the lecture. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a great privilege for me to be here uh, to address uh, this uh, audience on this special occasion. <coughs> this is not going to be a sermon, but I would like to start with a text. And my text is the famous closing words of Darwin's Origin of Species. Whilst his plan has been cycling on, according to the fixed laws of gravity, so it's just kind of beginning. Form first wonderful, have been and are being evolved. <coughs> a simple beginning. The young Earth, with its complex chemistry and geology, cycling around its orbit, is itself a very complicated system. 
<laughs> so what we're going to have to do is to go back before Darwin's at the beginning and to uh, try to understand the mysterious table. How starting with some mysterious Genesis event nearly 14 billion years ago, atoms, galaxies, stars, and planets have emerged. We have one planet, our Earth, evolution began, and Darwinian selection led to the emergence of creatures able to ponder it all. And I'd like in this lecture to highlight some themes that seem especially interesting and which confront astronomers with challenges for the coming decade. I can't claim to be much of a visionary looking forward, but here's a picture of somebody who was. Many will recognize him. This is Arthur C. Clarke. He lived in Sri Lanka and died in 2007, age 90. He said his greatest wish was to see the discovery of alien life. But sadly, he didn't. But he did live long enough to see human life venture beyond the Earth. He wasn't, of course, the first person to think about space travel. Among his precursors was the great Newton, the most distinguished alumnus of my Cambridge College. So I'll give him a plug. <laughs> Although I should say he was the most unattractive character compared to Darwin. Solitary and obsessive when young, vain and vindictive when an old man. But he produced this famous picture. This is from the English version of his great book, Rekitia. You see what's happening? A cannon is being fired from a mountaintop. <coughs> and if the cannon's fired fast enough, then the earth curves away under it, under the trajectory as fast as the trajectory curves. It goes into orbit. This is still, I think, the neatest way to explain to students the concept of orbital flight. Now, Newton could have calculated that to go into orbit, the cannon would have to fire at 18,000 miles an hour. Far beyond, of course, the cannon of his time. And it was, of course, Sputnik in 1957, which was the first object to achieve that velocity and go into orbit. But things then developed fast. Manned space flight, as it were, went from the cornflakes pattern to reality. And we had this wonderful picture uh, of the Earth seen from a spacecraft orbiting the moon. Only 12 years separated Sputnik from the first moon land. And it was only 66 years after the Wright brothers first flight. So many of us who were around then, and I expect most of this audience is old enough to remember this, uh, for then uh, we might have thought that by now there might have been an expedition to Mars. In 2001 did resemble Arthur C. Clarke's vision any more than 1984 resembled Orbitz. And the Apollo program now seems to young people a remote historical episode. They know there is a with men on the moon. They know the Egyptians built the pyramids, but these both seem rather strange uh, and typically motivated by bizarre national goals. It's 38 years since the last men on the moon returned to Earth. And I'm proud of this uh, souvenir signed by seven of the Apollo astronauts. Because it was a heroic episode. Astonishing achievement. NASA then had less computer power than there is today in a, a mobile phone, even perhaps in a washing machine. But since Apollo, hundreds of astronauts have circled the Earth in their orbit. But none has gone further. The race to the moon was an end in itself, driven by some of our rivals. But of course, we do now depend on space in our everyday lives. GPS, weather forecasting, and communications. 